The world is full of urban legends, remarkable stories that spread like viruses around the planet, mutating and evolving until no one can remember which are true and which are urban legends. In this episode called Bad Sports, you'll see three incredible stories that prove that physical activity isn't all fun and games. First up, hockey hero Bill Barilko goes on a fishing trip that costs his team very dearly. Then Jonathan Nesmith goes out for a lunchtime run, only to lose more than just a few pounds. And finally, Jack Yankovic is wrongly imprisoned for four years, but puts his time to good use. Watch all three stories and decide which ones are true and which ones are false. Find out if you guessed right at the end of the show. First, it's a story we like to call Losing Streak. Toronto, Canada has the CN Tower red streetcars and a famous hockey team. And one of the city's hockey heroes has a very bizarre story. His name is Bill Barilko. Meet Bill's sister, Ann Klesanich. We had so many good moments about Bill, and then they became tragic. But when something terrible happened to Bill, a mysterious curse fell on his beloved team, keeping their trophy room empty for over a decade. Yeah. On April 21st, 1951, Toronto faced Montreal in the final playoff game. Bill Barilko is desperate to win the cup. His nickname while he was in Toronto was Bashing Bill Barilko because he could body check and uh, he just bashed those players around. He's a good looking boy, he's got that wavy blonde hair, he's got that, that cherubic innocence about him with a little devil inside him as well. Bill Barilko was the spiritual center of that team. If Toronto wins, the cup is theirs. But the game goes into overtime with the score even at two goals each. With the coach urging Toronto forward, the puck suddenly falls to bashing Bill. And Bill scores the overtime goal. And now he's Toronto's hero. Three months later, Bill takes a vacation to the back country to spend some quality time fishing. Bill was fairly carefree, and he really was looking forward to getting back to Timmins to see his friends, see his mother and his sister, and get back and partake in one of the activities that he really enjoyed, fishing, which ironically was, was something that he enjoyed doing, but he couldn't stand the taste of fish. But when the time comes to fly back to Toronto, Bill and his buddy ignore the gathering storm clouds. It would prove to be a fateful decision. I received a telephone call saying, the plane hadn't arrived, and right away I gasped. Uh, yes. It was just like a Hollywood movie when they told me that an air search had begun. And there was just disbelief in my heart. I told mother, and uh, she broke down. Very, she, was, she almost went hysterical. And it was just heartbreaking. The Air Force, police, and public search for the wreckage, but they have to cover an area larger than Texas. They find nothing. The search went on for some time. The cold weather kicked in. The snow kicked in. The family was beside itself. They couldn't find Bill. As the 1952 season starts, Bill isn't the only thing missing. After four cups in five years, Toronto has lost the championship spark. 
They missed their epicenter, which was Bill Barocco, both on the ice and off the ice. I don't believe it! Year after year goes by without a trip to the finals, and uneasy rumors begin to circulate. There were so many newspaper articles that if they would only find Bill, they called him the ghost of the gardens, and he was labeled so many things that Toronto wasn't winning because of Bill. It looks like Toronto's only chance for salvation is lost somewhere in the Canadian wilderness. After 11 years of searching, Bill's remains are finally found amid the wreckage of a small plain in northern Ontario. The discovery has a remarkable effect on Toronto's fortunes on the ice. Toronto hasn't won the cup for 11 years, and the year they find Barocco, Toronto wins the cup. The curse of Bill Barilco has finally been lifted. So is this hockey hex historical fact, or have we skated around the truth? Find out at the end of the show. But first, check out this mini-myth. Mini-myth number 254, Hailstorm. Austrian Martin Bierbauer is sitting on his toilet when he hears a rumbling in the pipes. Moments later, he gets lifted off the john by enormous hailstones that burst from the bowl like it's a popcorn popper. The hailstones spill out into his apartment, forcing him to flee the building. His neighbors do the same, with hailstones popping out of toilets all over the apartment block. So is this story the hailstone cold truth, or is it just a wacky weather wind-up? It's true. In July 2008, a freak shift in the weather in Eisenstadt caused a torrential hail shower, which quickly filled a storm drain and found an exit of the apartment's pipes. On Urban Legends, we show you three amazing stories. You must decide which ones are actually authentic and which ones are ultimately untrue. So far, you've seen the tale of Bill Barilko, the hockey hero whose disappearance put a horrific hex on his team until his body was found 11 years later. But is it fact or fallacy? Find out at the end of the show. Now it's time for our next story. It's called Joggers Beware. Baltimore, Maryland has got itself a reputation for high crime rates. Now there's another one to add to the list, and it's all thanks to this guy. Meet advertising executive Jonathan Nesmith. I guess you could say I'm a pretty athletic guy. I like to get exercise. Uh, I usually go biking on the weekends. I play baseball uh, in the park sometimes. But on one particular day, Jonathan's love of sport would get him into a whole load of trouble. On September 7th, 2003, Jonathan is working hard, trying to score some football tickets for the season opener. There was this big, big game, and me and my buddies are really big fans. Let me check I tried to uh, acquire the tickets, which was, which was pretty difficult, but I, I managed to find uh, four tickets uh, on the internet. Now, I was pretty, pretty damn excited to get these tickets. So Jonathan puts them in a safe place and decides to celebrate with a lunchtime run. Here I was on a regular route down by the waterfront. Beautiful day, sun was shining, it was absolutely gorgeous. On his way back to the office, Jonathan takes a shortcut through a park known for muggings. I had never been pickpocketed before. I mean, you hear about it all the time. And actually, a friend of mine got uh, mugged downtown once but it had never happened to me. Jonathan's luck is about to run out. I was passing this one guy, and he bumped me quite hard, like I wasn't even in his way. I knew it wasn't right. I stopped, and I thought, well, that was odd. And I, I thought to myself, well, I'd better check if I have all my things. 
sure enough, I couldn't find my wallet. So I thought, this guy just robbed me. He just took my wallet. Those tickets were in there, and those tickets were irreplaceable. So Jonathan chases down the other runner. Hey, man! Hey! Give my wallet! Give my wallet back! Hey, 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 no, 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 what are you doing? Are you crazy? I knew you had it. Aha! You should have seen the look on this guy's face. I mean, I scared this guy to death. Later that day, Jonathan stops off for a quick bite on his way to the ball game. Great. Pepperoni, mushroom, throw some green peppers on there. Huh? That'll be, uh, 426. But the machine rejects the credit card and automatically dials the cops. The server stalls for time. We've been having a bit of trouble with the machine, so, you know. Hello? A few minutes later, the police arrive. I can't wait. Hang up the phone. I gotta call you back. Something's going on here. Put the wallet on the counter. What's going on? Just do it. The cop checks his ID. Is this your wallet? Yeah, of course it's my wallet. You sure? Yeah, whose wallet would it be? But that's not Jonathan's license. Oh my god. I can explain. I... I just beat up an innocent man. Because I thought he was mugging me. Meanwhile, here I am, mugging this guy. Jonathan had no idea that his own wallet had fallen out of his pocket early on his run. You're being charged with aggravated assault and robbery. What? <laughs> what are you talking about? We'll talk about it down no, Come on. That's fine. Come on. Come on. Cancel the pepperoni. So is this tale of taking tickets true, or is it just a misguided mugging myth? Find out at the end of the show. First, take a look at this mini myth. Mini myth number 711. The Iceman leaveth. Vitaly Matyukin is taken to hospital with severe heat stroke. He's diagnosed with heat exchange disorder, which means his body shuts down in temperatures above 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Doctors say his hypothalamus gland is no longer able to regulate his internal body heat. So Vitaly decides to move his family to Siberia and keeps their house like a fridge. He only leaves the house at night and during winter. His wife and son, unable to stand it, leave him in the cold. Have we given the truth the cold shoulder in this story? It's true. Vitaly's wife, Olga, eventually divorced him because she wanted to live somewhere warmer. On Urban Legends, we show you three astounding stories. Your task is to figure out which are fantastically factual and which are decidedly deceitful. So far, you've seen the tale of Bill Barilko, the hockey hero who went missing and took his team's winning ways with him. Their cup hoodoo was only broken when his body was found 11 years later. And the story of Jonathan Nesmith, the guy who thought he'd been mugged by a fellow runner, only to unwittingly become a mugger himself. But do either of these stories seem true? We'll let you know at the end of the show. Now it's time for a final story. This one's called In the Hole. Washington, D.C. is the political heart of the land of the free. It's full of people and organizations striving to spread life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. None more so than this guy. Meet aid worker Jack Yankovic. At this stage in my life, it's absolutely amazing how good it feels to feel free. Just walking down the street, it's amazing to be able to be with your family and your friends and, and do the things that you love doing. Jack knows what it's like to have your liberty taken away, but the experience had an unexpected side effect. In October 1991, aid worker Jack is locked in a Belgrade prison 
while a brutal civil war rages outside. I was, I was totally lost. I was in shock. All I wanted to do is get back home. While delivering mercy packages in war-torn Vukovar, Jack got on the wrong side of the Serbian militia and was arrested for spying. Uh, they interrogated me every day. They'd take me down to another room, seat me in a chair, and they'd tie my hands behind my back. His captors want a confession, but Jack can only tell them about his charity work. Why are you working for CIA in my country? I told you I'm not working for the CIA. I'm not a spy. didn't have anything to tell them. Look, just contact the U.S. Embassy. I'll tell you I'm a spy. I'm a U.S. citizen. You are a spy! You're spying against my country. I'm not a spy. I'm not working for the CIA. You're gonna stay here until you die, or you tell us the truth. I'm not CIA. <laughs> Months pass, but the routine of abuse stays the same. I actually thought I was going to die. I was so locked into this tunnel of depression and couldn't think of how to get out of this. I just had to find something. Then I hit on it. Golf. Before he was imprisoned, Jack loved to play a few holes. There is no greater feeling than spending a whole day on a golf course. It takes your mind totally off everything else. I've known Jack most of my life. Jack's a lot of things, but Jack Nicholas, he's not. Jack's poor golf skills were both embarrassing and costly. Nevertheless, he works on his game in his cramped cell. I practice day and night. I would play it in my mind, almost as if I was there. <laughs> I'd use my driver, my middle irons, my putter. I even drew on the wall a scorecard and a map of the course. It was the most liberating feeling that I could create. I think the guard thought it was nuts. But I don't think I would have made it without golf. It, uh, it saved my life. When the war ends in 1995, Jack is released and heads home to the U.S. It's just the most amazing feeling to feel free. It uh, was really great to be back home with the wife and the kids. I couldn't wait to be back out there playing golf. So Jack and his buddy head out to play 18 holes and see if his game has improved. I figured the best thing for Jack was to get back out there on the course, you know, after all he's been through and everything. I crushed the course the first time out. <sighs> he destroyed me. Jack even breaks par on the tricky course. Looks like practice makes perfect, after all. So is this story true, or does it have more holes in it than a golf course? You don't have to wait too much longer to find out. All will be revealed after this final mini-myth. Mini-myth number 410, outed by the auto. Carrie and her boyfriend Tom are enjoying an intimate moment in the front of her mini. Suddenly, Tom yells at Carrie to stop. He's pulled a muscle in his back and can't move. Panicking, Carrie disentangles herself and calls 911. Fire trucks and ambulances arrive. A paramedic tells Carrie that they need to tear off the roof to get Tom out. As a crane peels the roof off like a can of tuna, Carrie bursts into tears. The paramedic tries to console her, saying everything will be fine. Carrie says, no, it won't. How do I explain this to my husband? 
So did this make-out mini mangling really happen? Is it true or false? It's false. It's a tale manufactured in the UK, the birthplace of the mini. Now it's time to reveal the truth about our three stories. First up, it's the tale of Jonathan Nesmith, the jogger who thought he'd stolen his wallet back from a pickpocket, only to realize his mistake when he was arrested for credit card fraud. But is it true or false? This is a false story. <laughs> and this isn't my real hair. <laughs> A version of this legend was recorded in Britain as early as 1912. In this account, a woman accosts a fellow train passenger, wrongly believing that they've swiped her five pound note. So what about the story of Bill Barilko, the hockey player whose disappearance cursed his team to early cup exits until his body was found 11 years later? Is this story just a puck of lies? My name is Anne Klisenich. I'm proud to say I'm Bill Broco's sister, and this is a true story. Toronto hockey fans believe that the curse of Bill Barilko prevented their team from winning the cup between 1951 and 1962. The band The Tragically Hip even wrote a song about it. Which leaves the story of Jack Yankovic, the wrongly imprisoned charity worker who passed his jail time practicing his golf swing and turned himself into a regular Tiger Woods. But is it true or false? I've never been taken prisoner, and this story is false. First recorded in 1975, this urban legend is retold by countless motivational speakers. The myth usually features a Vietnam prisoner of war who shoots a hole in one from the first tee on his return to the US. That's the end of our episode called Bad Sports. Did you bet on the triumphant truths? Or did you lose your shirt on the frivolous fabrications? Don't worry if you lost big. You'll get another chance to separate fact from fiction in the next installment of Urban Legends. Urban Legends.